Thousands of lynchings of African Americans occurred throughout the United States in the post-Reconstruction era. The story of Jesse Washington is a disturbing tale of how depraved and compassionless the people of Waco, Texas were on May 16, 1916. Jesse Washington and his family were newly arrived in the area and had been working on the Friar Farm in Robinsonville, a suburb of Waco, Texas, for only about five months. And when on the morning on May 8, 1916, Jesse's employer, Lucy Fryer, was found dead in the doorway of the seat house. Her skull had been bashed in and her clothing was disheveled. She had been murdered and possibly also raped. Local law enforcement focused attention almost immediately on Jesse Washington, a mentally impaired man who had been working on the farm that day. It was not uncommon for lynch mobs to target black men who were mentally disabled or were strangers of the neighborhood without established support from the local white community. Jesse Washington was both mentally disabled and a stranger. Washington was quickly arrested by sheriff's deputies and taken first to the Hillsborough County Jail and then to the Dallas County Jail to prevent an immediate lynching. Lawmen who arrested him claimed that they found him in the front yard of his house with blood on his clothes. At some point while he was incarcerated, Washington supposedly told his interrogators where he had hidden the murder weapon. A blacksmith's hammer was discovered right where he allegedly said it would be, hidden in high brush and weeds near a hackberry bush. According to the testimony at Washington's trial, the hammer was discovered with blood and bits of cottonseed lint. While still in jail, Jesse Washington also signed a confession, which was promptly published in all three Waco newspapers. Since he was illiterate and could neither read or write, the confession was signed with an X. The confession outraged the Waco community even more than the original report of the murder. Yet there was no testimony about rape at Washington's trial. Dr. J.H. Maynard testified about Lucy Fryer's skull wounds during the trial, but made no mention of rape. Elizabeth Freeman, who was sent in by the NAACP to investigate the lynching, came to the conclusion that Lucy Fryer was not raped. On Thursday, May 11th, the grand jury called into a special session, indicted Jesse Washington for the murder. The authorities decided that he would be tried on Monday, May 15th, only one week after the body was discovered. The trial would take place in the 54th District Court, led by Judge Richard Monroe. Six very young and inexperienced lawyers were selected to represent Washington at trial. They had no contact with Jesse until the night before the trial, when he was brought back to Waco. When they did meet with him, they simply told him to just pray. The intention of city officials was to prevent a lynching by rushing through the trial and the expected execution of Washington as quickly as possible. They meant to demonstrate that the judicial process was greased lighting for someone as depraved as Jesse Washington, and that there was no need for a lynching, which had occurred in Waco in the past. Some locals even expressed the hope that after his conviction, Jesse Washington would waive the 30 days allotted to him before he would be hanged to, quote, prevent trouble. However, anticipating what newspapers called, quote, an exciting occurrence, thousands of people flooded into Waco during the Mother's Day weekend before the trial. They came by train and in the newly popular Model T Ford and also by horse-drawn buggy. They did not come merely to observe an interesting trial, which was predicted to be very brief. They came to see Washington get lynched. On the morning of the trial, it was estimated that about 2,500 people crowded and crushed into Judge Monroe's courtroom. Thousands more filled the courthouse and surrounded the building outside. Spectators had to be shooed out of the jury box so jurors could be seated. Judge Monroe demanded all gentlemen remove their hats, but he did not ask them to remove their guns or any other weapons they might have. The six young defense attorneys did not challenge a single juror. There were no defense witnesses and no opening or closing statement for the defense. From the little that is recorded of Jesse Washington's testimony, it seems apparent that he had little or no comprehension of what was going on. When asked how he would plead guilty or not guilty, he didn't even understand the question. His mental impairment was obvious, but the court didn't care. The jury retired for a grand total of four minutes and found the defendant guilty as expected. As the judge was recording the verdict, the crowd rose up, grabbed the defendant, and hauled him down a back staircase behind the courtroom and into an alley, tearing off his clothes as they went. A chain was wrapped around his neck as he was dragged down Washington Street from the courthouse to the town square where the city hall stood. On the way, he was beaten and stabbed by many men so that by the time he reached the town square, he was already covered in blood. 
Spectators stood on cars and buggies, climbed into trees, and leaned out of windows and climbed out of the rooftops of nearby buildings. Children on their way home from school also saw the spectacle. Coal oil was poured over Washington, and a fire was lit in a box. He was lowered into and out of a fire by the chain slowly as members of the mob chopped off his fingers, toes, and other parts of his body. Some of these body parts were kept in formaldehyde and shown off as souvenirs for years. After Washington's body had smoldered for a couple of hours, and people had grabbed bits of charred bone, links of a chain, and even splinters from the tree as souvenirs, a horseman lassoed what remained of the body and dragged it through the streets of Waco. What little that was left of Jesse Washington was put in a bag and dragged out to Robinsonville by car, where it was hung from a telephone pole in front of a store. The rest of his remains would later be buried. The NAACP hired women's suffrage activist Elizabeth Freeman, who was in Dallas attending a women's suffrage convention, to go to Waco and gather all the details of the lynching so that the story would be publicized in the NAACP magazine, The Crisis. The Crisis was then edited by W.E.B. Du Bois. Freeman obtained interviews with all of the leading figures in town and even managed to acquire the now infamous lynching photos. Freeman brought everything to Du Bois, New York, who then published the first ever special supplement to the crisis, which told the lynching story in grave detail, even displaying the gruesome photographs. Copies of the supplement were mailed to every member of Woodrow Wilson's cabinet, to every member of Congress, and to newspaper editors throughout the country. Freeman then embarked on a speaking tour around the U.S., telling the story of the Waco lynching and gathering donations for the NAACP's anti-lynching campaign. Only six years after the Waco lynching, an anti-lynching bill passed in the U.S. House of Representatives. Federal action was necessary because local communities simply would not punish lynchers, even though everyone knew who they were. The bill provided fines for counties in which lynchings would take place, and fines and imprisonment for officials who allowed lynchings to occur or failed to prosecute lynchers. This bill and subsequent versions passed three times in the U.S. House, but never became law because they were always blocked in the Senate. Today, many in Waco have never even heard of this lynching, and outside of Waco, the name Jesse Washington is nearly completely forgotten. Hopefully this video can educate people who may have never heard of this horrific atrocity.